Welcome to Tea Time Bible Study. Today we will be visiting the book of 1 Timothy. Now I hope you all were able to get through 2 Thessalonians um, successfully, reading about the second coming where Paul uh, wrote this letter to speak about to the people of, again about correcting their misunderstandings of how they should live their lives as Christians um, in response um, to God. Now, for our weekly reading, Romans 12, 2, that we read each week to remind ourselves why it is so important um, to study God's Word and make it a fabric of our daily life. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Well, let's move into 1 Timothy, uh, New Testament book number 15, written 62 to 64 AD. And as no surprise, the author was Apostle Paul. Uh, claimed the fame of um, this book, it was famous for giving instructions um, to the leadership of the church. Issues uh, Paul addressed in 1 Tim Timothy uh, the letter was addressed to um, to Paul's young disciple Timothy, um, who may have been experiencing some burnout at the time, like most pastors do, even in these times. So Paul is encouraging and advising Timothy. Important for you to remember throughout this entire book. Important points of Paul in 1 Timothy. Paul begins 1 Timothy by encouraging Timothy, obviously, to fight the good fight and not to let his young age be a hindrance. Paul then gives instructions um, for Timothy about leadership and managing all the different situations that he's going to be faced with um, in and out of the church. This uh, passage um, has been used, uh, these passages have been used over the centuries um, to train um, people in uh, ministry, um, even up through today uh, in church leadership. Famous verse we're going to unpack here today. Now, there's a lot here, so uh, we'll get through it, and uh, so hang with me. But it'll be great reading for you uh, this coming week, I'm sure. 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 19. Well, let me break it up for you a bit. I'll discuss this in three different sections. First, in 1 Timothy, Timothy 6, 9 through 10, uh, entitled The Folly of the Greedy Heart. We'll get back to that in a moment. In the second section, 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 16, uh, entitled True Riches Serving a Great King. And then lastly, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, where um, Paul gives a final word uh, to the rich. Now let's handle our first um, section that I mentioned above. 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10, The Folly of the Greedy Heart. And let me read that scripture. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, uh, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith in their uh, greediness and pierced themselves through with many arrows. Those who desire to be rich, significantly, the desire for riches is far more dangerous than the riches themselves. And it isn't only the poor who desire the rich. It is also the rich who want more riches. The specific uh, line here in these verses that uh, uh, caught my ear was, uh, those who desire to be rich, significantly the desire for riches is far more dangerous than the riches themselves. Now, poor does not mean that you're godly, right? Or the rich doesn't mean you're ungodly. Um, 
So no matter which way you look at that, um, being wealthy or poor really isn't the issue of what we're talking about here today. So keep that in mind. There were many godly um, uh, men and women in the Bible, um, and um, um, some of them were very rich, um, such as Abraham, David, Solomon. Now, in the first verse, in the first uh, verse we're going to go over here today, uh, we are warned: those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and trouble. Um, this. This verse here, um, desire for riches, uh, means it tempts our heart uh, away from eternal riches. Now, pause there just a second. This is really simple concept. Uh, as many things in the Bible, simple to understand, hard to do. Uh, but it is it is saying here that if we're always going after riches, and that's what we're worried about, that we're not focused on um, the eternal riches that God has for us in our life and serving in His kingdom. Uh, but as we said earlier, you can be rich and very holy, uh, but we'll talk about that a little later. Now, the, the desire to be rich can only be satisfied uh, in Jesus Christ, uh, rather than things of this world. There's the, there's the pull, there's the, the crux of what we're talking about here. And everything else is going to fall short uh, in life that many of you have probably already seen. Um, unless it's in Christ. The next verse, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Uh, the love of money can motivate any kind of evil on this earth. And, um, and please know that there is no sin um, that cannot be committed uh, for the sake of money. Meaning, um, if money is involved, there's a lot of potential for sin. Um, you know the old term you'll hear in many cases, just follow the money. Uh, there's so much truth in that. Uh, next verse, pierce themselves through with many arrows. Um, it goes on to say that this is the fate of those who um, live, live for the love of money. Um, and that they never can be satisfied uh, with that type of uh, focus um, in life. Um, you know, we're all human, right? Um, we, we sometimes want the opportunity. Say, hey, just give me the opportunity to be rich. Find out uh, if I'll be satisfied or not. Um, and that's, God knew that that was um, very much part of us, uh, part of a temptation. Um, but uh, we're told we should trust um, uh, the Word of God uh, and not be chasing after uh, riches as our main focus. Uh, and know that we've seen the experience of many of those who've chased after riches uh, and what it's done to their lives and where it's taken their focus. Um, theologian uh, John uh, Trapp uh, shares with us, he said, So, so do these strangle, drown, and poison their precious souls with the profits, pleasures, and advancements in their status or station, and many times meet with perdition and destruction. That is, with a double destruction, temporal and eternal, as some expound on it. Meaning in the now and later, uh, in the temporary, which is referring to our time on earth. Okay, now let's go to our second uh, area of our discussion today. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 16, um, again entitled, True Riches serving a great king. Let me read these scriptures, 11 through 16. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things, and before Christ, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus, Jesus is appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only Pontinent, 
the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who also has immortality, dwelling in the unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Well, let's jump into the verses of what I just read here. But you, O man of God, Timothy was uh, commanded to be different um, for those um, who live for riches. Uh, Timothy was um, was to go out and dispel uh, these arguments uh, of those who uh, misuse God's will and who who misuse God's word. Excuse me, uh, and who follow God just for what they can benefit from, uh, forgetting the purpose we have as Christians. Um, is to praise and worship God in all that we do. The next verse, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. So instead of pride and riches, Timothy made um, these things his pursuit. He answered the call. Uh, now these are virtues, all, virtues often not valued in our present culture, unfortunately but are very valuable to God both then and now. So therefore we should value um, the pursuit of righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and goodness in our lives. Next verse, fight the good fight of faith. Now doing what um, God calls us to do, going against the flow of this world, is not easy, right? Uh, but we're all called to do it. Um, Timothy was drafted um, into this good fight. Uh, God called Timothy, and Timothy freely chose to accept. Important to note that. We have a free will, and he freely chose to accept. Just as we have this same free will today to choose and accept God's call, or to deny it. Uh, Timothy um, had a soldier-like determination, uh, and, and God also calls us today to be determined um, to fight what it said, the good fight of faith. So when you hear fight the good fight, it means fight the good fight of faith. A fight where um, we're going to lose a battle from time to time, right? In life, you know that. Um, but we should carry on the good fight. There's no reason to stop uh, just because we're tired or we've lost. Um, and continue, find, reach down deep and keep and continue um, that great determination uh, that um, Timothy displayed until we receive eternal life. So meaning we just need to keep this determination and fight the good fight of faith um, throughout our entire time here on earth. It's what we're called to do. Next verse, in the sight of God who gives life to all things. Since Paul called um, Timothy um, uh, to be uh, into this difficult um, battle, it was good for Timothy to know and believe uh, these um, orders, this call from God, uh, from the Holy Spirit. And he did. Uh, he had a great mentor in Paul. And Timothy saw it as his obligation uh, to serve God, uh, who gave him life. So, Timothy got the message. Now, not everyone gets the message. The denial of God as our Creator uh, has done extreme damage uh, to our culture, both past, present, and future. Um, some of the biggest damage uh, has come simply uh, by uh, people do not believe that they have a God Almighty. They don't believe in a God. So for whatever their makeup or their experiences or their thought processes, uh, they just do not believe there is a God. And this can be very damaging. Uh, particularly if they um, decide to have some sort of witness. Next short verse, Jesus Christ. You know, by the Holy Spirit, um, um, the Holy Spirit gave Timothy uh, this difficult um, um, command to move forward, knowing how difficult it would be. For example, uh, God knows uh, when He sent His Son Jesus, uh, when He... Um, uh, the term in the scripture, witness the good confession, um, was before Pontius Pilate. Jesus admitted the truth about himself, agreeing with Pilate's statement that he was the king of all the Jews. Uh, you can see this in, um, if you want to make a note, Matthew 27, 11. You know, 
uh, theologian uh, John Calvin um, shared this with us, that Jesus testified um, to Pilate about the sovereignty of God, saying, you would have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from God. You can see this um, in John 19.11 and read around that a bit. He goes on to say, Jesus let Pilate know that God is in charge, uh, not Pilate. Uh, and then um, Calvin um, said, Jesus was silent about specific accusations, refusing to uh, defend himself, therefore leaving his life um, in the will of God, his Father. And you can um, see this confirmation in Matthew 27, 14. Now Christ's confession uh, before Pilate was twofold. First, with very few words, and second, by his voluntary submission to death. When Timothy was told to live up to the good confession uh, that was made in 1 Timothy 6.12 that we read, he simply was told to do what Jesus did. Uh, and he knew what that meant because he knew the story of Jesus and he knew what happened. And that he knew Jesus led by example. So Timothy followed. So here, just kind of personalize that in your life. And um, do we know the story of Jesus? Do we believe that he's our great leader and that, and have we answered his call to follow? Um, but knowing who he was and why he was here for us and all of those those things and that we're now supposed to just connect through the Holy Spirit and praise and worship God, all of these things, it's important. It's what the scriptures in here say is that we know and so we can follow as Timothy followed. The next line, until our Lord Jesus Christ is appearing. Uh, this was how long Timothy um, was supposed to fight the good fight uh, with his steadfast dedication. Uh, uh, with all his faith um, in his Lord Savior. So he was never supposed to quit uh, the good fight. Next words, um, he who is. Three short words. So as I said earlier, um, knowing who Jesus is will equip Timothy to fight the good fight. And you can put our, our names in there. Knowing who Jesus is equips us, equips Mark, Joe, Sam, Mary, Sue, all of us to fight the good fight. So we have to study the word. We have to know Jesus Christ. History is fulfilled with examples of, um, of armies um, that led uh, to spectacular victories uh, because the uh, men knew and loved their leaders. So how does this relate to what we're talking about today? Um, here are the words of Paul describing Jesus to Timothy. Now, in this, um, uh, Paul was wanting Timothy to really, really know and feel and experience Jesus Christ because he knew what Timothy was going to be up against. And he would really need to know Jesus uh, in his life uh, to have that dedication and sustain a lifelong um, journey uh, of um, his faith. So Paul said, Jesus is the blessed and the only continent the one who alone has all power and strength, who rules over the universe from an occupied throne in heaven. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The majesty of uh, man fades in comparison to the glory of Jesus. The richest, smartest, most influential person on earth are midgets next to King Jesus. Jesus alone has immortality, dwelling in uh, unapproachable light whom no man uh, no man has seen or can see uh, Jesus is holy Jesus is not merely man uh, he is truly immortal uh, without beginning or end uh, with a glory which is um, fully revealed um, would um, strike any human dead meaning we could not stand to be directly in the presence of God so that's how he, uh, Paul, described um, Jesus uh, to Timothy. Very powerful words, very beautiful. Next verse, to whom be honor and everlasting power. 
uh, knowing uh, who this Jesus is uh, should bring forward a response, right? All that I just read, and if you believe that, and you encompass it, and you've had experiences in your life with Jesus, um, and you know Jesus, uh, hopefully it has brought a response to you uh, in your life. Uh, that not what God can do for me, that's not the right mindset, but instead of response, a simple, profound worship, uh, declaring honor and everlasting power towards our great, almighty God. So as you, you've heard us say uh, many times, that we're here to praise and worship in church, to praise and worship our dear God as a church community. Now, the third section, as I described today, 1 Timothy 17 through 19. A final word to the rich. And I read, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come and that they may lay hold on eternal life. So let's do this verse, um, this line, rich in this present age. This phrase puts it all into perspective. Um, some people are rich now, right, on earth. Um, some have billions and billions of dollars. Um, but they may use their riches, they must use their riches responsibly and keep their primary focus on God, according to our scripture. Remember how we started off and I said, the poor can be godly or ungodly, the rich can be godly or ungodly, okay? So when we're um, talking about the rich now, um, they, it's saying that the rich must use their riches responsibly and uh, keeping their primary focus on God. Not to be haughty, uh, meaning prideful, so not to be prideful. Uh, pride is a constant danger, uh, we're told, uh, when we have these riches. Uh, it is very easy to believe that when we have more uh, than another person, um, that we're something special, that we're different. And, um, and God is really warning us against um, this, um, this haughty, uh, prideful um, attitude. So, our next line nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Uh, God knows our tendency. We're human, right? We want to have fun a little. We want to, uh, uh, you know, stray a bit. Uh, seems to be our nature. Uh, so God knows our tendency to trust in riches um, instead of Him. We see the immediacy in riches somehow, and we don't see the immediacy in our relationship with God, and we really need to see first the immediacy in our relationship with God. Um, God warns us against this danger uh, because He wants us to trust in Him, um, not to trust in these uncertain earthly riches. The next line, let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give. Being a giver and doing good um, with our uh, resources is what God um, set up to uh, guard our heart from materialism, uh, doing this good with our resources uh, and, trust, and, and avoiding us, like I said earlier, from trusting in these uncertain um, riches. Many think the main reason uh, that you give to uh, uh, forgiving um, to the Lord is because the church needs money. Well. The church does need money, but that's not the main reason. Don't miss the point here. So it is simply not the truth that you give the money to the church because the church needs money. Uh, the most important reason to give is it is God's way, God's way of guarding you against greed and the trust in these uncertain riches that we've been speaking about here. So think about that a bit. The next line, lay hold on eternal life. Paul said to Timothy, leave the pursuit of money aside and be content with your works. Uh, as, a, as a minister of the gospel, uh, he told Timothy that your hands are not big enough 
to hold two things. I really like this. Your hands are not big enough to hold two things. Therefore, since you can only hold one, see that it is the vital thing, and that is your work in God's kingdom, praising and worshiping our Almighty God, your work in God's kingdom. 1 Timothy um, 6, 20-21 was a final charge um, from Paul, uh, a short um, piece here um, I'll, I'll read. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and the idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing, professing it, some have strayed concerning the, the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Some beautiful final words there uh, from Paul to Timothy. Well, this concludes again our time together um, and our time together in 1 Timothy. As always, I hope you uh, have learned and are enlightening in your past readings and as you read this week. So, uh, next week we will be studying 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy will give us a look um, into the end of Paul's life. Um, and during this time, um, Paul was arrested um, by the Roman Emperor uh, Nero and then later uh, was martyred. Now remember, God loves you, so go out and love somebody else. Amen.